poštovani gledatelji, dobro večer, dobrodošli u prvu emisiju novog serijala Forum Europa koju N1 televizija radi u suradnji s Europskim fondom za Balkan. Emitiramo iz Europskog parlamenta u Briselu. U ovoj emisiji govorimo o transatlanskim odnosima Sjedinjenih država i Evropske unije, prvom dolasku Donalda Trumpa u Evropu, starim i novim partnerstvima i poziciji jugoistoka Evrope između Brisela, Vašingtona i Moskve. So on EU-US relations and the position of Southeast Europe we will discuss today with Ms. Rosa Balfour from German Marshall Fund. Good evening and welcome to our program. Good evening. With Mr. David McAllister, member of European Parliament and chair of Foreign uh, Affairs, Affairs Committee. Committee. Hello. Hello and welcome to the show. And Mr. Toby Vogel from Democratization Policy Council. Welcome to our program tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And just to start with, uh, with uh, tonight's team, uh, how do you see US-EU relations at this moment, Ms. Balfour? Well, um, the European Union breathed a sigh of relief when it realized that actually um, the policy of the US is not going to be as antagonistic towards the European Union as it appeared during the election campaign and from the first statements, the first few weeks of Donald Trump's administration. Uh, but we still really need to see what this means in concrete terms. There will be, uh, Trump will be visiting Europe for the first time um, towards the end of the month um, and we'll see whether he stays on for any bilateral talks. Um, certainly we do not come uh, this is not a presidency which is positively inclined towards the European Union as such, um, but it, it will be a presidency which will have to engage with some European Union member states. So really the trick will be how uh, capitals in Europe, how governments in Europe manage to make sure that the bilateral conversations are actually of European relevance. How do you see it as a chief of Foreign Affairs Committee and what do you expect basically from the first visit of Mr. Trump to Europe? Well, close Atlantic, close transatlantic relations and the support of the European integration process have always been key pillars of American foreign policy the last 70 years. Whoever was in the White House as a president, and I do hope that this will remain to be a matter of fact. Yes, there were some uh, disturbing uh, remarks coming from Washington before the elections, uh, after the elections, but in the meantime, I agree that we're hearing more positive signals, especially from the Defense Secretary, from the Foreign Secretary, from others. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Trump isn't so critical about NATO uh, in his interviews and speeches as he was uh, at the beginning of the election campaign. I think one thing is very important we have to talk. We have to engage on all levels. That means heads of government with the president in the United States, cabinet ministers from Europe with cabinet ministers in the United States, and of course, parliamentarians from all over the world with their, Europe, with their American counterparts on the Hill. Mr. Foyle, uh, four months after the election in, in the US, uh, we have a, a shifting of, of some positions that we heard in, in campaign. Uh, how do you see the next period? Uh, do we, are we going to, to see the more positive uh, approach of the US uh, administration towards the European Union in the months ahead? Well, I think you put your finger exactly on, the, on one of the main problems, which is this administration is all, is all over the place. And the president himself has been flip-flopping on a number of issues, such as NATO. You know, first it's not good, and now, well, first it was obsolete, and now it no longer is obsolete, whatever that means. Uh, the EU, first it wasn't good, now it is good. Um, but also within the administration, this is really an administration that's in disarray in the sense that it is very top-down, what the boss says is policy, but at the same time, it's very undisciplined. So you have all these lower level folks going out there saying things, you know, that then... To ease things. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I, I do agree that uh, there are strong material factors that, that sort of militate in favor of a strong transatlantic relationship. Uh, but having said that, I mean, the big, the flagship project between the two sides, TTIP, is dead in the water. Now, it's been dead before, before Trump, or at least uh, moribund. But um, if, you're, if you lack a, a strong common project, um, I think you sort of don't have an anchor for that relationship. It's floating a little at the moment. Uh, before we continue, we heard that uh, <coughs> Vice President Pence was in Europe reassuring our allies that things are going to be OK. Uh, Mr. Tillerson was here. Mr. Mattis was here on the security conference in Munich. So before we continue, I just wanted uh, 
for all of us to see a short, let's say, overview on where EU-US relations stand at this moment, so we will continue the discussion. To Europe's mainstream politicians, Donald Trump posed an almost existential threat to the European experiment. In their eyes, he threatened to pull the US away from NATO, pivot to Russia and abandon free trade and multilateralism. At the same time, he expressed anti-EU sentiments and flirted with populist parties across the Atlantic. I asked the vice president directly if he shared my opinions on three key matters. International order, security and the attitude of the new American administration towards the European Union. Firstly, I expressed my belief that maintaining order based on the rules of international law where brute force and egoism do not determine everything lies in the interest of the West. And that maintaining that order can only be enforced through a common, mutually supportive and decisive policy of the whole of the Western community and for millions of people around the world. The predictability and stability of our approach provide a guarantee or, at the very least, hope that chaos, violence and arrogance will not triumph in a global dimension. But the President did ask me to come here, uh, to Brussels, uh, to the home of the European Union, uh, and deliver an additional message. And so today it is my privilege on behalf of President Trump to express the strong commitment of the United States to continued cooperation and partnership with the European Union. Whatever our differences, our two continents share the same heritage, the same values, and above all, the same purpose, to promote peace and prosperity through freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. In a way, he softened his rhetoric, sent his vice president and secretaries of state and defense to Europe to reassure the allies. NATO is no longer obsolete for Trump, but the real test of allies' relationship will come at the NATO summit in Brussels on May 25th. For Europe, Trump's protectionist leanings mean a new source of transatlantic friction. Germany, with which the US has run a trade deficit for years, is particularly concerned, having been repeatedly named alongside China as a possible currency manipulator. Relationship with Russia remains unclear, especially after Trump's bombarding of Syria. Putin-Trump meeting will come in July at the G20 summit in Hamburg. The next few months, which include pivotal visits by Trump to Europe, will be crucial for determining the future direction of US foreign policy and its effects on Europe and the transatlantic relationship. So we saw it. It's kind of NATO now the, 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 the forum that will be the most important in this multilateral relations, Mr. McAllister. Well, there are two main killers of our transatlantic cooperation. The one is security and the other one is trade. Okay. I don't believe that TTIP is dead. I believe that TTIP is in a deep freeze mm -hmm. and it will depend on the American administration if we get TTIP out of a deep freeze again and have a new attempt to try and get a transatlantic trade deal done, but definitely then with a different name <laughs> and with a different approach. The name TTIP is definitely dead, that's for sure. And on security, well, NATO is the key pillar of global security and we in, in Europe are dependent on, our, on the support from coming from our American and Canadian allies mm -hmm. and I really like what Mike Pence just said in that press uh, statement uh, the day before he did that I listened very carefully to what he had to say in Munich and it was a very similar approach at the Munich Security Conference yes the American administration want to maintain the good cooperation in NATO but they expect the Europeans to do more for their own security and they expect the Europeans to share more of the burden, which from an American point of view is understandable. And by the way, this was already agreed in 2014 at the Wales summit under President Obama. Are Europeans ready to do more? Well, they all committed to uh, spend more on defence. A 2% target has been signed by all 28 member states of the European Union. But it's not only how much we spend, it's also about how we 
spend this additional uh, money. And that's why we now are seeing a debate, for instance, in my home country, Germany, you know, where people are, politicians are discussing, it's not only about just increasing defense expenditure, but to spend it in a more intelligent way. And that's why I strongly believe in closer European cooperation on defense and security. What we have in the European Union is 28 member states with 28 different armies, with 150 weapon systems uh, being used. This is certainly not sensible. Is the EU as such capable of, you know, getting a grip of itself in the moment that it itself it's experiencing with all the crisis? Is the US yeah. capable of EU. EU. Is the EU. Well, I think I think it's interesting that the, the, there have been sort of incremental moves to accelerate some of the, for example, defense cooperation that's been going on already. Mm. Um, it's not really quite at the level of headline stuff. You know, it doesn't hit the news. There's no European army in sight and so on and so forth. But I think those signs are encouraging because I agree with Mr. McAllister that this is obviously something that, that needs to happen. Um, Europe spends already quite a bit on, you know, if you look at the absolute figures, Europe spends quite a bit on defence, but it is highly ineffectual because you have a fragmentation of the, of the defence market, of procurement and so on, development. Um, so that certainly makes sense and I, I see encouraging signs there. I think that the, <clears throat> the sense of being left alone a little bit by Washington um, or just harangued at the rhetorical level might have scared the Europeans into, into doing more and that's certainly a good thing. The other thing of course is Russia where I think mm -hmm. today you have a, a threat assessment that is perhaps not shared by everyone but that is shared by an increasing number of, of member states and that would be another factor that would, uh, would support greater integration in that field. As Mr. McAllister put, we have two uh, main pillars of this strate strategic uh, relations. One is trade and the other is security, uh, which will come first to, to, to settle. Um. Well, as Toby was saying, some moves have been made on the um, security front. I do not think Europeans will be able to, they will not be able to uh, provide uh, security guarantees for European territory outside the NATO framework exactly. in, you know, for at least another generation, but some decisions are out there. Um, the other area where actually, if I can just add on to what Toby was saying, where uh, Europeans are actually showing some sign of unity, and this is unprecedented after many years of quarrelling, is actually on Brexit. Um, and the existential threat that British departure poses to the rest of the European Union has actually made member states toe the line. And we've seen a lot more discipline in the past few weeks than in the past few years. Um, so I think that's a big game changer. Um, on trade, I think um, we can... In, in many respects, we can afford to take some time because the trade problem is not just on the other side of the Atlantic. We've seen how difficult it was in the EU to get through um, CETA, the agreement with Canada. Um, there are, there's a whole election series uh, going on in, um, in Europe, uh, starting from France, but then there will also be Germany. In many EU countries, there's a lot of anti-trade sentiment. So I think actually it would make sense to tread that carefully. Uh, whereas on the security front, we have some uh, systemic threats um, which need to be addressed. Um, one of them is Russia, as uh, Toby mentioned. Um, um, another one, of course, is terrorism. So there's a deep need to increase cooperation in those fields. Now, on trade, the EU has made, um, you know, mm. the EU negotiates on behalf of all the EU member states on trade deals. On security, we're still talking about, about member states cooperating occasionally. So a lot actually needs to be done. So it makes sense to invest a lot of attention in that area. Uh, how do you think that, because the EU is at odds with Russia, uh, and how do you see this new let's say, possible strategic alliance concerning these main threats of today we have, that is terrorism, these are unresolved issues of Syria, Ukraine probably, Iran deal, which is on the balance at the moment concerning some messages from the Trump administration and not to forget uh, North Korea issue. So basically, how can we see this new relation of Moscow and Russia? We saw what Trump and Putin talked the other day, basically it was a 
what was uh, in the media, it was a good phone conversation. They will meet in Hamburg on G20. So what can we expect from that and where EU stands in between? Ms. McAllister, you can start. Well, of course, everyone who's sensible is interested in better relations between the European Union and Russia and between the United States of America and Russia. And, uh, you know, we didn't ask for these sanctions. We didn't ask for the deterioration um, of our relations. And we certainly need cooperation with Russia to solve international problems, like, for instance, in Syria, uh, or how to deal with Iran. But one thing is clear, Moscow is responsible for a, a violation of the international uh, uh, order, uh, the biggest inter violation of the international order since 1945 in, in, in Europe. Um, they violated the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine and our only response possible was a diplomatic response. And I mean, the Minsk agreement is on paper. It's up to the Russians to start to fulfill what has been agreed. And once we can implement what was agreed in Minsk, then we are ready to lift sanctions. But really, Moscow has to deliver. And this, there will be a clear reaction from the West. And I think we've got to show solidarity with our partners and friends in Ukraine. Rosa, Toby? Yeah, well, um, I think again, on Ukraine, the EU has also shown a degree of unity which should not be underestimated. <clears throat> what is crucial is that the US pursue, continues to pursue what has been agreed with respect to Russia, um, on the Ukraine front at least, um, also to preserve that unity. Um, so that's where the engagement and the dialogue really needs to continue with Washington to make sure that uh, the policy line that has been adopted since 2014 is not interrupted and is not um, changed. Of course, with Russia, there are plenty of other dossiers in which the conversation needs to be had. Um, we need to be realistic about that. Um, but I think Europeans should really not forget that there is uh, what it, uh, uh, appears to be quite a systematic policy on part of Moscow to undermine European unity on a number of issues. And they're using uh, certain ge geostrategic spots precisely to do that. So Europeans need to be aware of that. And I think the, the Trump administration needs to be made aware of it if it isn't already. Do you see Balkans as the sum of that geostrategic points? It certainly is. And what we're seeing um, a Russian um, interference in Balkan politics, which um, has been unprecedented. Although Russia has always been an actor in, in, in the region, um, and there's no problem with that. But actually, the pursuit of fake news, uh, the involvement in the media is actually quite worrying because a lot of it is aimed at undermining the European Union. Well, I think that, that the, when it comes to Russia, probably European disunity is a bigger threat than, than whatever the administration might decide. Having said that, of course, if the, if the US administration were to scrap sanctions, that would, that, would set, that would encourage those countries such as Italy that have been very lukewarm about, um, about EU sanctions on Russia from the beginning. Um, I, I fully agree that this, this united front ought to be preserved at almost any cost, simply because if, if the EU cannot respond to a flagrant violation of international law and, more importantly, of the international order, um, as happened in Crimea, um, then one has to ask the question what the EU can do as a foreign policy actor in its immediate neighbourhood. We spoke about uh, transatlantic rela uh, relations in terms of trade, in terms of security, but we missed the, the, to point out the, the third big part, big, 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 big subject, and that's the uh, shared values, that's the supporting of democracy, which was always on the agenda of NATO, of the Western democracies. Is that the, the subject that is missing and left the, the doors wide open for, the, for the, this crisis with, with the relations with Moscow? Well, what we in the West have in common, especially the Europeans, the Americans, but also the Japanese and the Australians, is to support democracy, the rule of law, respect of human rights, gender equality, religious tolerance throughout the whole world. And these have been driving forces of our joint foreign policy achievements in the last decades. And 
I think uh, Angela Merkel and other European leaders were very clear when they pointed out to the new US administration that we hope that we continue this cooperation uh, on a basis of uh, joint uh, values. And um, some decisions of the new American administration were perceived in a very critical way uh, in Europe. Uh, but uh, in the last few weeks, I think Washington got the message and there are still independent courts in the United States, which also show that an administration can't do everything it wishes to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, before we continue, uh, we touched a bit uh, about the Balkans and the southeast of Europe in, in these previous uh, minutes. Let's see why more and more people uh, are advocating uh, for renewed U uh, US engagement in the southeast of Europe. <laughs> Pictures from Macedonian Parliament. Pictures from the streets of Belgrade. Uncertainty lingers in southeast of Europe and about the future of a united Bosnia and Herzegovina. Heightened tensions between Kosovo and Serbia. Russian influence in the region particularly seen in the case of Montenegro joining NATO. High youth unemployment, radicalization and fighters from the region that participated in conflicts in Ukraine or joined ISIS in Iraq and Syria. The refugee crisis that imposed difficult burdens on the nations in this part of Europe and has sparked border security disputes between neighbors. From our eastern to our southern neighborhood, an arc of instability has evolved. Strategic directions east and south have become major sources of destabilizing influences and threats to the safety and stability of Europe and the entire Euro-Atlantic area. And those influences, their vectors aimed towards Europe, meet and intertwine precisely in Southeast Europe. Ill-fated notions of spheres of influence, which should have been left behind in the Cold War era, influence the political processes and affect the internal stability of the countries of Southeast Europe. After his recent trip to the region, U.S. Republican Senator John McCain wrote an editorial to Washington Post, where he reminded that the U.S. needs to start paying better attention to this part of the world. With political and security risks, he warned of failed economies and widespread corruption. McCain concludes that the U.S. is ignoring the region in its own peril. Over the past seven decades, writes McCain, U.S. have made the choices and the sacrifices to uphold that commitment throughout Europe during the Cold War, in Bosnia and Kosovo in the 90s, and today in the nations on NATO's eastern flank. U.S. must be prepared to uphold this commitment again in southeastern Europe, writes McCain, for the lessons of history are clear. Talking about lessons of history, people say in the 90s, before the US came, nothing was basically happening from the side of uh, Europe. Is this the case now? And can we see basically larger uh, uh, engagement of the US in the region and in what way? Well, I'll tell you a little anecdote uh, last week. Um, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, Hoyt, no. Hoyt Yee, was in, in Skopje. And he seemed to get some concessions from the president, who previously had refused to give a mandate to the opposition leader to become prime minister. Um, now, whether he will follow through with that commitment, I don't know. It remains to be seen. But it is telling that a relatively, you know, a mid-level official from the US government achieved things and frankly got the level of respect from some of the players that in Skopje that uh, the enlargement commissioner of the European, of the European Union isn't really getting. Um, what that tells us is that the US involvement, I think, is still indispensable where wherever there's a crisis, because the EU has proven to be not to be up to the task. Basically, after the visit of Mogherini, things <laughs> erupted even more in Macedonia. Uh, Mr. McAllister, you are part of EPP, the largest, the strongest uh, political group in the European uh, Parliament. On your summit in Malta, 
Mr. Orban, for example, he was like saying that you must stand aside of Mr. Gruevsky no matter what. So how are you within your political group responding to what's going on in Macedonia? And basically, do you think that EU failed in this case? Well, the situation in the Western Balkan countries is worrying. Mm -hmm. And John McCain, as we just heard, is absolutely right when he says we have to pay more attention, we have to pay better attention to this region. You know, this region lies in the heart of Europe. It's one hour's flight time from Munich. And I'm sometimes surprised how indifferent many politicians react to the developments in our immediate neighborhood. One example, you know, the, the coup attempt in Montenegro last year on election day. Mm -hmm. I was surprised that you hardly got any international reaction. It was obviously that the Russians were behind uh, this uh, incident to de destabilize a country which is about to join NATO and is on its way to join the European Union. Now, the Western Balkans are very complex. Also, the political landscape is very complex in each member states. We have, as an EPP, member states in five of the six, member parties in five of the six countries. We don't have a sister party in Montenegro. Our cooperation partner in Macedonia is Vimro, but the EPP with Johannes Hahn and others have been clear that we call on Vimro to accept the outcome of a democratic election in Macedonia and also to accept the building of a new coalition. Uh, Vimro became strongest party, yes, but in German history there are examples, for instance Helmut Kohl in 1976 got nearly 48% of the vote but he still wasn't chancellor in the end. In the end you need a majority in the parliament and what we call on our sister parties is to accept democratic decision-making processes and it's always better to be in a parliament instead of camping outside, like for instance in Tirana. But did the EU fail basically? Because we know that since Juncker Commission came, we know that there won't be any enlargement probably in years to come. So basically, what momentum can these European values have in Western Balkans if these things are, are going on. No, I think the yeah. European Union needs to change tack, mm -hmm. but the overall strategy is the right one. What we're mm -hmm. talking about is a prospect of Euro integration, integration yeah. into European Union structures. Um, membership might take some time, and it, during that time period, no doubt, much more political attention needs to be paid to the region, but the strategy of democratic transformation is the right one. And frankly, this has to be a European responsibility. US support will be welcome. The US is broadly quite popular in the region, but it has to be a European responsibility. The Balkans are inside Europe. They're inside the European Union geographically. It's basically an enclave. If you think about, you know, Greece, geographically, the Balkans are inside Europe. This has to be a European responsibility. And I think the problem is that what we've seen is that there has been continued engagement on part of the institutions with the accession track, but we've seen diminished engagement on part of some member states. Um, and we've seen some political messaging, which has been directed to internally towards the European Union, like the Juncker statement, but is not good diplomacy outside. So I think we need to get our leaders to think a little bit more clearly about who they're talking to and what message they're sending across. Um, I also think political parties can play a bigger role. Um, given that we're talking about integration into Euro-Atlantic structures, then there is a case for saying that it's not all about institutions and governments, it's also about political parties, it's also about civil society, and there's a lot more that can be done on that front. So I wouldn't talk about a failed strategy. I will talk about a distracted European Union at the highest political levels, while the sort of normal track of accession has actually continued. There are some things within the accession process that need to be definitely uh, rejigged. Um, and the democracy piece is an important one. I think we've had, um, again, partly a distraction, partly probably misplaced uh, prioritization. Um, democracy has been failing in the Balkans. After a pretty good decade of improvements, in the recent years, we've seen failings there. We've seen failings also in the European Union. So the two things are connected. Um, and that's, where, that's why I call on political parties, institutions such as parliaments, civil society organizations, organizations um, to actually pay a lot more attention to this. I think it's been clear 
and the message is clear from you know yeah. past enlargements, future enlargements. It's very important that these states are truly transformed so that the rules of the game are clear and that the democratic um, equal level playing field is there for everyone. Are there potential for more uh, energy towards changing or, or uh, changing the pace in the foreign action uh, between Brussels and the region? You've noticed in the last few weeks that uh, the message has been heard in Brussels that um, not only Commissioner Hahn, who's very active uh, in the Western Balkan throughout the last few, three years, but we also have the High Representative now visiting all six countries. The European Parliament is getting more involved. We're debating the situation in these countries. I believe that all six countries of the Western Balkans have a clear European perspective. And with two countries, we are already negotiating EU uh, membership. Um, but this will all take time. You know, to become a member of the European Union is hard work. And you can only join the European Union once you fulfill the criteria. But I also see that EU no accession negotiations are a tool to, um, to foster necessary reforms when it comes to the economy, when it comes to making a society more democratic. So we should pay more attention to the Western Balkans, perhaps critically analyze if the tools we are using are correct. Something which always surprises me as a rapporteur for Serbia. The European Union is by far the largest donor in this country. But polls show that a majority of the Serbian people believe that Russia is the largest donor. So we have to ask ourselves as European Union, are we doing enough in telling the people in these countries what it is all about to cooperate with the European Union, what it's all about to eventually become a member of the European Union. I think we can do better and we have to do better. And one other point, I call on all politicians in the Balkans, in all six countries, regardless of which party they're coming, to respect territorial borders and to respect the territorial sovereignty of all six member states. And that's why I don't believe that neither talk about Greater Albania or talk about Greater Serbia, which we haven't heard in the last few months, is helpful. But if you have to, to underline that, that call for respecting the sovereignty and territorial inter integrity, uh, is there a threat uh, nowadays for those things? So basically this track was not that well, well, beautiful if we still talk about this kind of instability. This is manipulated by local elites to foster hatred, to gain consensus. And I think what really ought to be done is what international actors should do is make sure that using these threats um, is not incentivized. In fact, one should disincentivize that. There have been moments and there have been politicians who've talked about reconciliation. They're not there anymore. We need to work with those elites to try and build that message for the, for the rest of the region and create disincentives. Our politicians who exploit um, past divisions uh, should, should, should be shamed, publicly shamed. Yeah, but and they've alternative. been voted for on the democratic yes. elections, basically, more or less. Well, democracy is more than elections. Yeah. Um, and I think one, one of the things that really shocks me about the current state of the European Union is to see how thin, perhaps, how superficial the transformation of, of enlargement countries of the last big round, i.e. Hungary, Poland, um, also Croatia, um, has been. That, that worries me. And it worries me to see that sort of tradition, you know, basic democratic values and, and rule of law and so on seem to be under threat in some of the established member states as well as in the United States. Um, but there's another point that I think is important to understand, which is that I, I have no doubt personally, I'm not going to make any prediction, but I have no doubt that you know, 10, 15, maybe 20 years from now, these countries will be members of the European Union. Short of the European Union itself disintegrating, I have no doubt that this is going to happen. But the real question for me is, how will they have been transformed? And it's very important, in my view, to understand that these countries are not the same as Hungary or Poland in the 1990s. We are talking about incumbent elites, political business elites, that do not want to join the European Union, despite all their rhetoric. 
you know, the Gruevskis and Vucic of this world have no interest in joining the European Union. Not because it's so, so far off, but because it will completely undermine their own... Model. Their own, yeah. Exactly. And as long as the EU pretends that these elites actually do want EU membership and are willing to undertake the reforms that are needed to get there, um, I think this is like spinning in a hamster wheel. Yeah. yeah, but talking about hamster wheel, you have, you know, Mr. Orban being questioned here in the European Parliament, being questioned here and there about his policies, and basically nothing happens. We have instruments to guarantee that the rule of law is respected in those countries who are about to join the European Union during the accession negotiation process. Um, the question is if we have enough and adequate instruments to make sure that the rule of law is respected in member states of the European Union. Uh, we have had uh, some critical weeks uh, as regards Poland and Hungary, but uh, the Commission is in a dialogue uh, with these countries and I think the Commission has made very clear mm -hmm. that uh, certain developments um, won't be accepted in the European Union. So we do have the instruments and um, I was at a meeting uh, with Viktor Orban on Saturday where we discussed about the importance of the, uh, uh, the, 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 importance of the academic freedom uh, which also applies to an EU member state, um, Hungary. There's just one point where I would um, just, if you allow, take a different view. Um, I deal with Serbia a lot as the rapporteur and uh, I do believe that the government of Aleksandr Vucic is clearly committed uh, to a European integration process of Serbia. Um, um, so um, I wouldn't share your view that Mr Vucic is a only process, yes, until it gets really hard and he would be forced to do all the things that would undermine his own power. Well, he's already been forced to do things, to open first chapters. It's hard work to join the European Union. But I also hear from representatives from outside the political spectrum in Belgrade that they say be as tough as possible during the negotiations because we need these uh, democratic reforms as we have seen in other Eastern European countries including Croatia. Mm -hmm. And when we are speaking about negotiations of Serbia and EU and uh, opening the chapters, let us now see the view from Belgrade and the head of uh, Belgrade's team for negotiating the EU session. Ten. What is so new and different? Why are we talking about shifting transatlantic relations? For Tanya Miščević, head of Serbia's team for EU accession negotiations, it is not just Donald Trump's victory, but the decision of American closest ally, UK, to leave European Union. Since the very start of it, in the 50s, US worked hard to create its most significant trade partner and then political ally as well. I don't see why new American administration would change that policy, especially in times of uncertain and challenging international relations. Good and sincere talks are to be expected among still most significant trade and political partners, now in slightly different situation and conditions. But apart from economics and politics, United States and European Union are connected by another issue. There is one thing we should certainly not forget. NATO partnership programs, security and defense structures connecting almost the same circle of countries. It is widely accepted that membership in NATO is a precondition to EU membership. That road was never accepted by officials in Belgrade. Serbia insists on policy of military neutrality. It is practical, not military reasons, that actually lie at the core of many EU members' decision to join NATO before entering EU, explains Miščević. We often discuss about noticeably better starting positions for countries that first became members of NATO and afterwards of EU. The same group of countries decide on whether a country is qualified to become NATO member, as well as that country's EU membership. Besides, membership conditions are pretty much the same. Most important issue is rule of law, respecting human and rights of minorities, stable institutions, stability of state itself. It is very hard to expect that once a country fulfills necessary conditions for NATO membership, that it will not be admitted to European Union. During election campaign, Trump has openly questioned future relations within NATO. 
Southeastern Europe was never mentioned, so it is expected Washington to be more reserved when it comes to the countries of Western Balkans, even giving them over to Brussels. Position on NATO went U-turn. What would happen with Southeastern Europe? There were many talks in the last few months since new U.S. administration arrived. Whether America is going to withdraw and Europe take over its share of the deal or bigger chunk of work in this region. I don't believe that it is going to be subject of talks at this summit. Is it good or bad for us? You know, it is always good when you are not on the table when the big ones are talking. But it is also not good when you are not around the table. So we are not taking part in that conversation and it would be good to talk about region that certainly is interesting. We can see different things all around us, things we could solve together and obviously we still need the attention of both EU and USA. In Mischewicz's opinion, battle within Europe, battle for European values will be even more important than repositioning in transatlantic relations. Is it easy to achieve? No, it isn't. For countries that became members in 2004, 2007, even 2013, those processes came with enormous acceleration to prepare the state and its structures but also society for membership in EU. And then, of course, that you will have sloppy sides of it. When you go fast, it's hard to put all elements of that big puzzle into fine frame. I'll just remind you of some of those elements. It is reform of justice, fighting corruption, protection of basic and especially minority rights, question of asylum, visa and migration, where you have great disagreements between member states. Western Europe, on the other side, if we are allowed to make such division, a system of its own values, European values, built during centuries. They have been built for four or five centuries. That this balance will surely be prolonged for a while. We can see that even some member states are not in position to introduce some of those mechanisms, such as Schengen system for freedom of movement in Bulgaria and Romania. Well, that's a real struggle. So we heard Ms. Mišić from Serbia, we can probably disagree on this NATO-EU alliance. case of Turkey is probably one of the most obvious that we have on the table. But talking about influences in the region, let's go back to what we uh, discussed. Mm -hmm. More and more people, we heard also Croatian president warning about influence of Russia, probably Gulf countries, Turkey in a way to this whole agenda. So. Is that a risk for Balkan state or maybe some kind of opportunity for new economic alliances, inputs, because of this spirit of reforms and new accession in a way stale? The trade relationship between Russia and the Balkans and Turkey and the Balkans is below 10% mm -hmm. of the trade of the Western Balkan countries. Let's not forget the real economy data. The real economy points all in the direction of the European Union. Diplomatically, um, the, the EU has been weak, and that's true, and the EU has been distracted by its own internal problems. But the sort of path that has been set about is not about to derail completely. Russia has been very good, and Turkey and other actors have been very good at overplaying their real influence um, through the use of media. Um, and I think that the awareness is growing, and I think we can expect some policies to counter that kind of influence. It does require political commitment on part of the top level, and I've said this already, but also, and that's why I'd really like to insist on this, democracy building is not just about government relations. It also has to be about relations between societies, institutions, organizations, and that's what needs to be built in order to make sure that the Western Balkans become sustainable democratic states and that their own citizens will make sure that those processes are in place. That's what is needed. We all know that these values are under threat throughout Europe, for sure, um, in consolidated democracies. We're seeing episodes, events, which are indicating that there is some deconsolidation of democracy. But we can also see equally strong forces that are getting their act together and, you know, could stop being the silent majority and actually start being more active on, on the democratic front. All of this will be um, of use to Southeast Europe to continue pursuing that path that has been set out 
a decade ago, more or less. But where is the potential in Western societies to connect with societies in Southeast Europe when we have all these countries in the West, they are more looking in itself nowadays? Well, it, the, the inward looking is largely a reaction to the interna internationalization of our lives. Uh, but the, the, fact, the fact of modernity is that we are interconnected. And the, the challenge is to find the right processes, the right policies, the right political elite to manage that interconnectedness in a way which is of advantage to everyone. We haven't really seen that. We've seen a very uh, negative impact of the financial and economic crisis. We have seen political elites perhaps it's not all up to the challenge um, that we've been facing, but this can change. New generations are coming in, new ideas are beginning to, to uh, are showing, beginning to show their face. Um, so, so there is momentum there for alternative actors to look at things somewhat differently. Um, for the Balkans in particular, I mean, let's not forget. First of all jobs. Economic, the Balkans are doing a little bit better economically, but this is not reflected on the job market. So that's one thing. Otherwise, there's a real risk of a lost generation. And that's something perhaps the where, you know, op more open economies can actually help. Um, it's a fairly skilled uh, region compared to other parts of the world, so that perhaps there are opportunities there as well. We need to be more, we need to pursue more open policies. Um, we know, for instance, that visa liberalisation in 2008 had a very positive impact on societies there. Let's think about some new policy that can bring about greater mo mobility. Let's also create incentives for young Balkan talent, which is not in the, Western, in the Western Balkans right now, to go back to the region and to create startups, for instance, to inject some dynamism in the economy there. Um, there, there are opportunities out there that can be sought. Um, the problem is that we've been so um, stuck with our own uh, difficult um, uh, internal European issues that we're not really, um, you know, uh, looking at the opportunities enough. So maybe just to conclude, is Southeast of Europe, Western Balkans going to kind of stay in the limbo in between EU's own internal issues it has to solve and new US administration, huge priorities in the world that it has. And is there basically any kind of uh, idea where to can cooperate to, to, save, to save this part of the world? Well, I think building on what Rosa just said, I, I think in due course it will become obvious that Russia is not an alternative in any meaningful yeah. way to European integration, to, you know, all the reforms necessary to join the EU. Um, in trade terms, in, in, in political terms, even though at the moment it may be attractive to some segments of Serbian society, Montenegrin society and so on. Um, I also see some glimmer of hope in a renewed and more political engagement by some uh, Western European leaders. Um, you know, we, we were joking about the uh, free world having a new leader in the form of uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel. Merkel has been paying attention to the Balkans for, for a number of years now. And while I'm not terribly uh, impressed by the results so far, it is a good thing that governments in Europe outside the EU accession process are now thinking about the Balkans in more political, more strategic terms. So it's not, it's not all bleak, but I fully agree that one of the key um, elements of a, of a brighter future is, is economic and, and that really, the, the situation really has to change fundamentally. Mr. McAllister, for them, yeah. How much attention will Berlin uh, give to Southeastern Europe until the September election in, in Germany? Well, yeah. as it was just correctly pointed out, Berlin has been paid, paying attention to the Western Balkans. It was Chancellor Merkel who started the so-called Berlin process. And I think this was an important signal that member states of the European Union show more commitment. And it's about more commitment towards concrete results on infrastructure, on bringing young people together. And one thing we Germans know very well, History has shown instability in the Balkans mean instability for the whole of Europe. Stability in the Balkans means stability for the whole of Europe. That's why it's in our own interest 
to support the development in all six Western Balkans towards more economic prosperity and to strengthening the rule of law and democratic societies, we have to pay more attention, we have to pay better attention to this troubled part of Europe. And I still believe in the potential of the Western Balkans. I believe the greatest thing I always see is the young generation in these countries who are still so convinced that the future of their countries lies in a united Europe. And that's why we should support especially the young generation. Ms. Balfour, Mr. McAllister, Mr. Fogel, thank you very much for participating in our show. Thank you. Poštovani gledatelji, pratili ste prvu u nizu epizoda Foruma Europa iz Evropskog parlamenta. Hvala vam što ste bili s nama.